two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with James Blatch and Mark Dawson. We hope you're having a great week and looking forward to a great weekend. And if you are taking part in NaNoWriMo, good luck. It's day two, so you should still be going. Day two. I can remember doing it back in 2010 and it was the third week that was the killer. In fact, had I not, I think I've told this story before, I did a, I was scheduled to do a Radio 4 interview on it. Had I not been scheduled to do that interview, which they said to me, oh, it's going to be next week, I don't think I would have kept going because it is a it is a real commitment. Um, is it? It's kind of, if you want to be a writer, it's kind of important to write. So, um, yeah, I don't well, I was, know. I was in a full-time job at the time and you've got to do, what was it a couple of thousand words a day? Yeah, something like that. Like 1,500, I think, It's yeah. which is kind of nothing um yeah but it's, I, it's, it's nothing to do i mean i you know i'm writing at the moment i'm doing two or three thousand words when i sit down and write but but to keep going without stopping and structuring or anything else you do it you're bashing out that it's you know don't play it down it's it, and most well, first, people don't succeed first time is, i can see that yeah it's, it's a bit more of a thing but i mean I, you know, if you've been doing it for a while that, that's a small word count um but you know if, if you if you are starting and you, and you don't know what's next and you haven't written something before then i can yeah it's difficult and but. that's what most people who do NaNoWriMo are it's a first it is i think it's a first timers thing i mean so i know i know experienced authors use it to bash out a first mm. draft and so on but i think most people yeah. who do it are doing it because they yeah. fancy having a go at writing a novel yeah 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 no fair enough so um yeah and uh yeah if you're doing that we um we want to support you on that and i uh, would love to hear from you if you want to post into the group let us know how you're doing find your little mutual support groups and you can do some um some writing blasts together yeah, we have a we've got a, a kind of a subgroup we've set up on facebook so i can't remember exactly what the url is but if you go to the self publishing formula community on facebook um, and do a search for NaNoWriMo. We've set up a group with, there's about 100 people in it at the moment who are supporting each other and giving tips and you know sprints and things like that to, to help get your word count down for the day. Yeah, it's good. Well, that's how I started, you know, 2010. And uh, that book is still going, going strong at the moment. Still uh, still enjoying my process. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that's good. Well, you should yeah, definitely uh, ride the enthusiasm and get it finished. Yeah, yeah, no, I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's not. It's, it's not every day. Is not absolutely easiest thing in the world. There are. I'm going through a slightly trickier period at the moment when we think. But I'm thinking more about character development than I thought I was capable of. In fact, I'd worried that I don't have that kind of because I write short stuff for the news for years. Didn't have that longevity, that long form stuff in me. But I'm now really thinking about character development and um, and who these people are. I went to see First Man. Uh, which is the biopic of Neil Armstrong. And it was a fantastic film for me to see because what they show Neil Armstrong's character like is the character, is the theme of my book, is these closed off individuals who have people die alongside them so often that in the end there's nothing. They don't want to open themselves up to anything anymore. Now I know this because I've been brought up by somebody uh, very, very similar to Neil, Neil Armstrong. And in fact, there was a little moment at the beginning of the film where Ryan Gosling playing Neil Armstrong says... I'm getting ready f to go to the UK to see the Delta Wing. Well, that's what my dad was flying. He was flying the Vulcan, this aircraft behind me if you're on YouTube, the Delta Wing. Um, and it wasn't Neil Armstrong who went. He, he flew with another Edwards test pilot who was alongside Armstrong at the time um, called Major Harry Andonian, who I had an email exchange with a little while ago. Uh, but Armstrong at that point decided to apply to NASA because he was being grounded. So that, that little moment in the film was a very close... Uh, linked to my dad which is amazing um had my dad been american he could have walked on the moon he was exactly he was doing exactly what neil armstrong was at that time but um we didn't have a moon project uh, in uh, solihull wherever he was uh, boscombe down in fact near you yes but yeah but um so that character stuff and and this is this is new to me so this this slow Chain. I mean, it's, it's 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 many things. A, it's a character which is like just there. You can decide that person's going to be evil. This person's going to be emotionally, uh, can't use that word. Emotionally stunted, better word. Um, or, but you've also got a layer on. 
it's got to be conflicted because people aren't straightforward. People often appear one thing, but internally they're a bit conflicted about it. They're aware of their, their frailties and also they change. There's three things you think about of that character uh, in a book and um, doing a lot of that at the moment. So this, the writing, the word count's gone down a little bit whilst we get this stuff uh, right, but, um, but really enjoying it. Really enjoying it. And uh, good. And you've put me on to a fighter pilot to, um, to interview, Dave Gledhill, who actually was a navigator in, uh, in Phantoms and uh, Tornado F3 here in the UK. And he's going to come up. So um, that's going to be, we're trying to put this together at the moment, aren't we? Three basically traditional authors who are moving into indie and their reasons. And I had a few exchanges with Dave already uh, on this subject. I've just read one of his novels, actually. Um, so it's very interesting from his point of view. But it is generally, and Dave's one of these people who's just thought that's how you do it traditionally that's how you do books and they're sort of aware of the indie side but not not really looked into it now suddenly they've got their toe in the water and it's uh, you can see the enthusiasm building and the scales falling away from the eyes a little bit on some of the financial returns that are possible with um with the indie side so that would be a good little series yes indeed yeah and i've got a couple um uh, yeah three three authors that we're looking to hook up for a little uh, episode on that so yeah keep watching space are uh, you not doing nanowrimo well, I was going to, I kind of am in a, in a way, but I, I started a new project, the one I've been thinking about for a while, with a new character, a police procedural private investigator series set in Salisbury. Um, and I um, I finished the last Milton book and I, I was going to wait until, well, I, I don't wait around. So I've got two weeks for Nano. I'm not going to not do any writing until two weeks and then start. So I started writing. I've started dictating um, this one. And three days last week i did twenty five thousand words which is uh, is just ridiculous I, in my normal i'm happy with a couple of thousand words a day um given that i've got a lot, a lot of other things i do as well but i was doing i think i did the most was eight thousand words in one day that's I mean, my best ever is eleven thousand uh, writing normally but dictation has been it's amazing i'm really impressed with it um and and to my surprise it hasn't affected the process of writing at all it's just it's it's just a different way of getting the words out, um, and it's it's much quicker. Um, and you know, provided that you you know accept that it's not going to be as clean a draft, at least for me, uh, as it would be if I typed it. It is blazing fast, and I kind of get my scrivener word counter up, and I'm going like, you know, good grief, that I've done. I'm doing three and a half, four thousand words an hour. It is really unbelievable. And you're doing? Are you sitting at your desk doing this? I sit or stand. So um, often I'll stand and just. It's weird. I kind of I don't look at the screen when I'm dictating. Uh, I look away. I'll sometimes just close my eyes and um, and mm. just and try and get into that kind of space that normally expresses itself through my fingers. Um, yeah. And now it just it's just a different way of getting to what I want to say. Because um, I'd always I'd always been not self conscious, but I thought that di- differing the process would affect the quality of the writing, and it doesn't appear that that's the case. Um, so this is potentially quite exciting for me because if I can suddenly triple my word count um, in in less, you know, if, instead of like four hours to do 2,000 words, I can do 2,000 words in an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, that is a game changer. Um, so, yeah, I'm enjoying that at the moment and I'm very enthusiastic about this this book as well. So, yeah, it's all um, it's all good. So anyway, by this rate, I'll be finished by Nano. Um, yeah. So <laughs> and you're um, this new book there is Police Procedural, is P.I., uh, Salisbury Noir, I think we described it as previously. Have you um, plotted it out? Because police procedures can be quite yeah. technical. Or, or they don't look. They, they shouldn't read technically, but technically you have to be aware of, of procedure. Well, only in a, in a not at this stage. In in a rough sense, you do, but all that detail will be. There'll be a very thorough edit, which will take longer than I would normally my normal edits, because it will also it will be addressing typos just from the dictation errors so you know it gets it does get some things wrong um but also that's the stage and it would always be the case that, that would be when i go to um, experts and ask for help and um i've got um uh, the, the retired i think a senior a policeman from the the sussex area who works on peter james's books he's he's working with me on this and then um, i've got a, a private group of about 10 to 15 um either serving or retired police officers who helping me with with detail as well and and also um last friday i uh, mentioned last week in the podcast i had did an event with andy maslin a salisbury author and he he knows the detective chief superintendent he's just retired for, for wiltshire okay. um and, and he's going to hook me up with him so he can help me with 
kind of geographically specific questions with regards to setting up a, a procedural in Wiltshire and also just general police questions as well. So yeah, I've got a, a pretty good team to help me with this one. Um, and all of that detail, I layer that in in the edit. That's, that's the way I do it. And when you've done your dictation, is your first round of typo correction edits something you do or do you farm that straight out to somebody no, else? No. I may actually, um, I'm writing non-sequentially at the moment. So this afternoon, I might actually jump towards the end of the book and write something um, there. Um, so that's just, you know, Scrivener enables you to write that way. And I've got a, a rough idea, better than rough, of, of what the twists and turns are in the book. And, you know, in the sense of it, it's discovery writing for me as well. So, I'm, you know, as, as I go along, I'll have an idea. And it might mean I'd change some things. It's happening quite a lot at the moment, but that's that's fun. You know, it's 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 then you just go and write some different scenes and then, then it all gets tied together when I go go back and do the first edit. So yeah, all very good at the moment. I'm, I'm enthusiastic about it. Excellent. Good. Well, some I'll, I'll finish it. I'll finish it before you finish <laughs> You yours. will. You'll you finish how many well, at some point you'll count how many books you've done in the time I've done my first. <laughs> um but there you go. Uh the uh Jean Granger is our interviewee today and i don't know whether she dictates i can't remember whether we mentioned this in the interview or not but she writes long books they are they're big books lots of word count uh dynasty type um dramas um set in ireland where she uh, lives uh, she actually came to london and we hooked up there together should i say hooked up as some um, we got together in American sense. Hooked up means something different, but we got together to record this interview. I should say, got together. <laughs> keep, keep digging. We met each other in London. Actually, was in a hotel room, um, but uh, we just <laughs> did the interview. She's a very lovely person, and uh, she's somebody who uh, I think probably we got to know her because she did the ads for authors course, which she mentions in the interview. And it's, that's certainly been a, a, a big thing for her, but very interesting to talk to. And she's somebody who relies on a very close relationship with her editor as well. Uh, so very interesting to talk to Jean. She's coming up now. And then after we've heard from uh, our hookup experience, I'll be back to have a little chat with Mark. Jean Granger, welcome to the uh, podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. You've actually flown in. You're one of our guests. We occasionally have guests who fly in to be on the podcast. Oh, Jet Setty of me. You've flown in. <laughs> to be fair, it wasn't Ryanair, but he still flew yeah, in. Yeah, he, okay. Will, 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 this is the guy in the Ryanair <laughs> part of him. Yes, I Which flew in. Which for our American listeners is the uh, an, air, an airline inspired by Southwest Airlines, which is yeah. their, kind of their budget. But um, yeah. Uh, anyway, we've had our chat. Funny enough, we'll come on to that because I think it's an interesting area. We talked about Amazon and Ryanair and the kind of criticism that the big beasts always get. Uh, but you have a very healthy attitude, I think, to all of this, which we're going to come on to in this podcast. But first of all, let's hear the story of school teacher Jean. Was Miss Jean Broody a school teacher? She was. She was. There you go. <laughs> she was. <laughs> Miss Jean Granger, the school teacher, who is now smiling away because she is a full time writer. Uh, congratulations on that. But let's, Thank you. Let's hear how you you did made that transition. Uh, okay, so um, I started out actually as a tour guide of Ireland. I did that for 10 or 12 years and then I decided to become a teacher. So I went and trained and I became a secondary school teacher and I did that for 14 years. Um, and for the last couple of years, I suppose, I've, my first book, I published my first book in 2013, so five years ago now. Um, and at that time I had no idea or no clue, to be totally honest, uh, about how things were going to go. Um, I was really in the dark, like everybody who starts out, you know, hoping that I would just stuff my manuscript under the door of some worthy literary person who would realise its genius immediately and write me a huge cheque. And well, the Booker Prize would then oh, come well, obviously, obviously your way. Well, obviously, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but alas and amazingly that didn't happen oh. weirdly I can't, you must be the only I'm one. still head scratching about <laughs> yeah. that um, but anyway I didn't when I smile when I hear people talking about the rejection letters mine must have been so bad I didn't even get rejection letters I got nothing I just crickets nothing it was like I sent them a phone bill um, so for a long time I sent it out to various different people and um, nothing and I chucked it in the drawer and said, that's nonsense. And obviously they know, you don't know, um, they know it's rubbish and that's the end of that. Uh, luckily my husband, who's uh, my biggest fan, uh, wasn't accepting that. And he kept saying, no, you've got it, you've got it, you've got it. So uh, I stumbled across uh, an editor and uh, 
I, I had sent the book to several editors, uh, all of whom shuddered and didn't either responded in a one line or didn't respond at all. Oh, so you couldn't uh, even hire an editor? No, not really, no. Um, the books that I write have lots of characters, right. okay? Um, and they're, it's tricky in terms of genre. They're not, they don't fit into easily into any genre. So um, I found this editor, Helen Falconer is her name. Uh, she lives in County Mayo, she's British. And she very bravely took on the book. And a couple of other people had seen it in the industry, traditional industry, who said, no, t too many characters, it's a mess, it's a train crash, don't do it. Helen was braver and said, yes, it's a train crash and yes, it's a mess, but we can fix it. Uh, so we did. And she's worked with me in every book since and she's fundamental to the entire process. Um, and so I had this book that was then whipped into some kind of shape, but I didn't really know what to do with it. So I uh, uploaded it without a copy edit or really a proofread other than myself and my husband and my mother, uh, who we thought were pretty good at this. Mm. Turns out we're rubbish at it. Mm. <laughs> um, so when I say this is a very steep learning curve, oh my God. So I uploaded this thing that was just full of typos and mistakes. You had and a cover? It had a cover, yeah. I was really lucky. I've, it's the only one of my books, I think, that still has the original cover. I change covers often, but um, I was rooting around on all these, you know, self-made covers and blah, blah. I uh, couldn't find anything. And that night on Facebook, a friend of ours put up a photograph on Facebook that a friend of his had taken locally. And I was like, that's it. That's the cover. Uh, okay. And uh, I used that and it's been, uh, with the exception of my book that's just come out now, it's been my most downloaded book. Um, and so I think the cover, it's a, it's a good cover. Um, so I was lucky, I had a decent cover um, and a friend of a friend was a graphic designer so she put the cover together. So that actually looked relatively professional. Um, however, how, oh, however, the inside the was, commas and the oh, appalling. Oh. I'm sorry, okay. she knows I'm gonna have to scratch. That's all. <laughs> um, so, anyway, um, I mean, you're, you're, you weren't alone, obviously, at this. Uh, at somebody who's written a book doesn't really know what to do and uploads it to Amazon, it's got errors in it, by the way, just because there's lots of people listening thinking, mm -hmm, I did that, or yeah. you know, well, I'm doing it, <laughs> yeah. Now. Oh, um, I mean, it was, yeah, so, but, absolutely, but of course, then it was. People were actually remarkably kind, like kinder than I deserved. What, to the be kind totally... of people who bought it and reviewed yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, like it was getting really nice reviews and people going, well, I mean, apart from the fact that it clearly doesn't have an editor, right. um, there's maybe something here. And uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate in the sense that I, um, because I was a tour guide for a long time and the groups I would take around Ireland were Americans. Um, I, my, my market is Irish America. Essentially, I've readers all over the world, thankfully, and I'm grateful for each and every one of them. But m fundamentally, yeah. Irish America is my market. Um, so, and because I'd spent so much time with people who had either an interest in Ireland or who had Irish ancestry, I kind of got what was going on with them and what sort of things they would be interested in. So I wrote books along those lines. Um, so the first book did well, realized thankfully relatively early on that it was a mess, took it down and got it properly edited and proofread. And I think at that stage I might have encountered Nick, uh, Nick Stevenson, who um, I, I started on that process with him in his um, first 10,000 readers. I didn't have a website. I hadn't the faintest idea how to set up a website. I certainly didn't have, when he was on about, we'll give away one free one, and then there's another free one. I'm like, are you mad? I, I only have one. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I worked into it and I, I figured it out. And um, that worked out fine in the end. Um, then I, my second, that was selling quite well, um, better than I imagined. Um, and then I wrote, uh, at, at one incarnation of my life, I was writing a PhD uh, on Irish women's involvement in the Second World War. And I, after a couple of years of it, I, I just realized that I would much rather people pay me to read what I write rather than me pay somebody to read a big, long, footnoted, boring PhD thesis. So I 
scrapped it and I wrote it as a novel. Okay, that sounds like uh, a more interesting way of doing it anyway. It certainly is, yeah. And uh, So let me just skip back oh, yeah. before we go forward. So um, first of all, your your editor, who you've, you've named and said was, was great and has been a key yeah. part of your success, but did she not steer you in the direction of proof editing and copy editing before you uploaded? Or did she, was, oh, was she just unaware wait, so of the She's how, traditionally published. Yeah, so she didn't so really know how she, to, yeah. you know, um, I think she would have assumed that I would have yeah, done okay, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to assume anything with me is probably a mistake. Yeah. I mean, I do um, notice a lot of the, the we have conversations with editors quite often, and and most of them are, comp- are much less aware of how indie works and than you think. Yeah, no, she they're doesn't just, really they're about the books, and they're used to the yeah. old world, and so yeah. anyway, yeah, yeah. So, and she okay. is, you know, she's very well respected herself in her own yeah. traditional publishing world. So, okay. um, she and, would have and, people to do that, I guess. And so you, you followed Nick's advice uh, I followed early Nick's on, advice. and you started making sales. I or, did. Yeah, okay. I did. And um, then, um, and I, I write fast, okay. which I think is, if I suppose if I was to give any advice, you know, some of my traditionally published friends, you know, they write a book a year. Mm-hmm. You're not at the races in the indie world if you're writing a book a year. You know, you you'll be on beans and toast for a lot of years if that's how it's going to be. You need to be quick. Um, as quick as me, because I've been writing my first book for ten years. Well, I have to tell you, James, I smile because every time I hear the intro to the SPR, yeah. goes, one who's just starting out. How long more is he going to be starting out? Well, we don't. We can't afford a new voiceover. So <laughs> it's I've, time for a new voiceover. Yeah. I think maybe one who started out quite a while ago yeah. and should be further along by now. Um, anyway, but, a point yeah. taken <laughs> on board. So yeah, yeah. But yeah, you know, you need to be quick. Yeah. So, um, so I and everybody has a different way. You know, I. I don't plan out my books, they kind of occur to me as I'm writing them, um, so I don't know how they're going to go. Um, and I'm, I was working full time and I have four children, so um, busy house, you know, as you can imagine. Um, but um, the second book I wrote, because it was my PhD thesis really, which I'd fictionalised, that was, the research for that was done already. So, um, and I moved into the genre of historical fiction, so I write both contemporary and historical okay. Irish fiction. Okay, so I was going to ask you a little bit, before we get move on, let's talk about the books itself. You said they're quite difficult to place clearly into a genre. So that first book with lots of characters, what...? Oh, they're all difficult to place into okay. a genre, yeah. Uh, I suppose, well, no, the, I have, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, I have four historical fiction okay. set firmly in the kind of 20th century in Ireland. Okay, um, what, what period of the 20th century? Uh, two of them are set during the Second World War. Okay. Uh, one is set during the 1916 Rising. Okay. Um, and uh, hmm. the other one set in the 60s. I'm trying to remember okay. which book I read. Uh, yeah, that was set in the 60s. Um, and then I have a series that is, um, was inspired by a, an, a woman I heard interviewed on the radio one day who had been released from these dreadful orphanages that are in the news so much yeah. now. Um, so I kind of fictionalized her and wrote a trilogy about her. Um, and the the tour series, which is the first book I wrote, um, the fourth book of that has just gone to the editor. So now. you've got three series, or two? I've got yeah, I've got a series of the tour. I've got this a trilogy, and then I've got four standalone history books. Okay, so and you say historical, historical, fi- historical fiction. Are these mysteries or just no? They're sagas, I suppose. Okay. They're you know they're okay. family sagas. They're like Dynasty or Dallas. I'm joking, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very like that, without yeah. the shoulder pads and oh, the diamantes. What a shame. Though that may be a thing I need yes. to introduce. The 80s will be next. <laughs> Possibly, there's what, there's what I've been doing wrong. Yeah. I need more diamantes more shoulder pads and shoulder and pads. Yeah. Okay, right, that gives us an idea. And prolific, because 2013 is not that long ago. No. And you've uh, got nine, you say? Uh, uh, ten. Ten. I've, uh, ten. I've one written that's going into an anthology. So that'll be out in January. I've another one with the editor, and I'm a third of the way through another one. Okay, all right. So, so I have three kind of on the go all the time. And let's pick up the career side of things again. So you you I got your book online. You sorted yourself out a little bit in terms of the basics, mm-hmm. uh, learning through Nick Stevenson yes. at, at this point, um, and then what? At some point, you were earning enough money to go full time. So how did that happen? Uh, well, I did part time for two years. Okay. Um, so I was earning enough money to go part time for two years, uh, and being a you know cautious civil servant, uh, you know I uh, I think there's a little bit of Stockholm syndrome <laughs> with, the, with the public service that you kind of uh, come to rely on your captor if not love them. Um, 
So I was a little bit, oh my God, you know, the government permanent pensionable job. And in Ireland, civil servants are paid quite well, teachers are paid quite well. And I was in a fairly senior position in the job I was in. So it, was, it wasn't likely that I was walking away. Um, but it just became a time management thing. It wasn't that I didn't like my job. It just became a time management thing that I was coming home in the evenings. My two younger children are only seven and ten. Um, so, you know, it was difficult to do, like all working mums, you know, homework and dinners and finding the thing they need emergency for tomorrow. Um, and in between that, trying to write and in between that, trying to correct and prepare lessons. And it was just all getting too much. Um, so I decided to make the leap. Um, so I did. And uh, this is my first September not going back to school in quite some time. I wow. should be in probably double Leaving Search history at the moment. <laughs> right. How does that feel? Great. Yeah. <laughs> Great. But it's, it's like, you still feel so. I mean, I, I made the leap from full time to work for myself as well. And it is unsettling, I think, I think at the time. It's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Unsettling would be an understatement. <clears throat> it's terrifying. Like, I. Thankfully, my worries are not financial on a day-to-day basis but there's a you know the thing about the civil service or any permanent pensionable job is you'll always be paid you know there wasn't any direct correlation between how hard I worked and how much I was paid um, which is both frustrating and in a way kind of reassuring Um, this is very much connected you know the harder I work the more money I earn it's really simple. But you're obviously quite entrepreneurial, and, and I get the feeling... I wouldn't have said so at all. No, no but you not clearly at all. are. Well, well, that has happened. That's something I've just discovered about me, but uh, I didn't think I was. No. Yeah. No, I come from a family of accountants, and I can't add, you know. Right. Um, but you said double maths. Uh, no, history. <laughs> oh, history. Oh, yeah. God, no, not double maths. <laughs> I didn't let you lose some maths. Yeah. No, I'd have been bewildered <clears throat> in double maths. Okay, so you, um, and I know you picked up Mark's course at some point yes. as well, which has probably helped, so we should probably stick that in to, as this is a, the SPF podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of feel like I graduated from Nick to Mark. That's not to say you couldn't stick with Mark with Nick Stevenson, I'm sure you could. But I wanted, I kind of, I suppose I was intrigued by the Facebook thing. Um, and I might as well be honest, the reason I don't do Facebook advertising is I find setting them up too hard. Right. Um, and I know with the course it's outlined, but I have a very low threshold for that, you know. Um, AMS advertising for me, um, and the way Mark described it in first day, excellently done. Um, I followed his advice to the letter. I now run maybe 300 ads at a time. Um, wow. I spend a lot of money on ads. Wow. Um, but it, it's, you know, they're, they're profitable. Um, and I do some book bub advertising through uh, that I learned how to do from Adam. Thanks, Adam. Um, Adam Croft of yes. SPF. Um, and it, you know, I, Adam's another example. I, you know, I just emailed Adam out of the blue one day and said, "Listen, I'm really stuck with this. What do you think?" And he's like, "Try this. Try that. Don't do this. Do do that." You know, um, and it that's the kind of, and I think Mark, because Mark is open and helpful. He has created that kind of um, an ethos or an atmosphere, mm-hmm. you know, and there's no, you know, I've never approached anybody in this thing. And I hope nobody's ever approached me where they've met anything other than, sure, how can I help, yeah. you know, um, which is great. Yeah. And it can be quite a lonely business. You know, you're on your own a lot of the time and you're in your own head a lot of the time, which isn't an ideal place for me to be anyway. But uh, so it's nice. There's nice camaraderie and we have a bit of a laugh in this Facebook group now and again at things that happen or, you know, you can share your woes and your miseries and you can share your victories and, you know, people you, will... You've got quite a good little uh, group of, uh, of friends have, on, in the SPF group. I, I have, so. I have, yeah. We've got, um, we've got the, what we call the angels. Um, there's a bunch of us and uh, we're all over the world writing in everything from YA fantasy to erotica to um, Christian fiction to health to oh god I'm leaving people out mysteries there's there's everything Um, and between us I mean we have such a wealth of information between us Um, but it's just great it's a little it's a little sidebar to the to the course and we talk to each other every day I'm going to Australia at the end of this year and I'm actually meeting up with them out in Melbourne uh, which will be great 
um, we literally talk every day. We've never met, but we talk every day. And nobody really gets how this works. You know, nobody does. Even our nearest and dearest don't really get how it works. So um, it's really important, I think. Especially oh, you mean outside, outside of the yeah. indie community? Yeah, yes. we haven't yes. how no. it works. It is quite um, difficult to explain, isn't it? You spend your whole time trying, trying. to explain what, why trad is different from indie, and then yeah. the, all the prejudices come up from people who don't really know and it. you feel yourself trying to defend it or something, <clears throat> yeah, and then yeah, you get cross yeah. at yourself for even bothering, you know? And it's just... Well, very soon you'll just be able to say to them, what book did you read last? And they'll name the book. So, well, that was indie. They yeah. know Because, you know, there's so yeah. many books, uh, the crossovers. In, oh, it's invisible, becoming, right? yeah, it's becoming, you know, so um, more acceptable, I guess. Yeah. You know, but to people who don't know, you know, you say, oh, it's yourself published. Oh, right. It's kind of God love you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> um, but you have to just let that go. That's people who just don't know. And... Let it go. So let's, let's go back to the career. So I'm, I'm interested, and I know people listening to here are, are at various stages, and a lot of people listen to the podcast who want to do what you've done on this journey. So I'm trying to pick up um, some of the tips, how to do it, how to do it some <laughs> of the tips along the way, and, and you know what, what have been the key moments? Do you think in terms of uh, of, of getting yourself um, uh, your income up from books? Um, the courses definitely. I mean, they're basically it. Um, putting being very disciplined about time like I do think it's true you know the harder you work the luckier you get mm-hmm. I I work very hard at this I put in a lot of hours you know um, and I will write every day for maybe even when I was working full time like I, I I realized something had to give so I, I don't watch TV I haven't seen TV for years um, I watch an odd thing on Netflix with my husband when you know, <laughs> but rarely. Um, so at that time that people spend, say, watching TV in the evenings, I'm writing, um, and you know, having to do the marketing. I, I think one of the things for me was, you know, I was a bit tech phobic. I still am, maybe, um, but to embrace that, that's the business. You know, you you might as well be sitting there howling at the moon if you're not going to do the marketing you know you have to do it and nobody and I see it all the time with people trying to find ways of outsourcing it trying to get someone to run your ads or trying to get someone to run your website or try and I outsource loads of things I mean I can't design covers obviously I can't edit I can't proofread I have a guy who does the tech of my website but but at the end of the day you have to stay in the driving seat yourself and you have to learn it and it's it's not easy and there are days when you want to fire the whole bloody thing out the window but you just have to go right fine have a cup of tea or a gallon of wine or whatever floats your boat and get back to it you know it's work and it's great when it works out you know and for example the AMS ads people contact me and say oh my god I've, I'm running five ads and they're not working and you know it's costing me loads of money and I go, well the first thing is that the ad itself isn't you know this is all about exposure so that particular ad you might be losing a dollar a day or two dollars a day on that ad but people are seeing your book yeah and they're seeing your name you know and if you're in if you're exclusive as I am they're reading in the the library and so there's more ways of measuring it than just looking at the ACOS and going, is it 70%? Oh, it's not. Kill it. Yes. Uh. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a subtlety that you learn through trial and error yeah. experience. And that, as you say, there's no shortcut. And I think Mark's shown, shown in figures that um, he runs what look like um, campaigns at a loss, mm. but they're actually at a profit because yeah. of the read through yeah. uh, that happens afterwards. Ernie okay. Dempsey said a great thing to me when I was Ernie trying Dempsey to. Ernie Dempsey says so many great things. He does. He really does. And he's an ex teacher as well. Hello, Ernie. He is. Uh, but he said to me, and this really stuck in my mind when we were talking about advertising, he said, Gene, Coca Cola put billboards up all over the States. They have no idea how many bottles of Coke they sell, but they know if they stopped doing that, they would sell fewer bottles of Coke. And I think that's the way to look at advertising. I know that's easy to say when you have a small budget and you're kind of trying to make every penny count, but you do need to speculate to accumulate. And I, it could be my fear of maths as well is leading to this, but I don't overanalyze the ads. You know, I make considerably more than I spent. 
and that's really <laughs> that's yeah. as much maths as I need. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, in fact, one of the things I do with our SPF campaigns, our and all our AdWords campaigns, is I'm now relaxed enough to start a new campaign with new imagery, new endpoint, and leave it for three days. Don't look at it mm. because if you start looking at it, think well, it's not serving, it's not you know, there's a problem. You need data before you can then start making changes. So leave Absolutely. it for a bit, allow leave it, it to, for a bit, allow yeah. it to, like with the MS ads, and you have to leave money. it for two weeks. And I know people say, well, I can't afford it. Well, actually, you do need to spend one hundred and fifty dollars yeah. on a campaign to get any kind of data out of it, yeah. and then start making changes. So, and you know, when I see people who are on a tight budget, I would say, okay, look at where you're spending the small budget you have. You know, there are things you don't need to outsource. You know, you can go to Fiverr and get a cover. It's not going to be the world's best cover, but some of them are okay. Mm. Some of them are fine. You know, you can. There's tons of stuff that you can do really cheaply. Um, but things like, but actually turning sales, which is really what we're about, you know, then you need to spend a bit of money doing that. And I suppose it's a bit like taking the course, you know, it's going, am I willing to invest in myself? Because that's what you're doing really is you're investing in yourself and taking a chance. And if you're not willing to do that, well then you might as well go home because you're not going to get somebody else to do it if you no. could, you're not prepared to no, do it. No, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay, let's talk about process for a bit then. So you say you write a lot. I do. Uh, and long hours, say, so do you write all day or? I, at the moment I don't write all day because my children are on school holidays. Okay, so that, you must be counting the days down I to I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my husband is a teacher as well, so I'm getting rid of them all in one fell swoop. Oh, there next you go. one day. <laughs> Much as I love them. Um, but yeah, so I write... I have a kind of a minimum thing in my head that I have to write between two and three thousand words every day. Okay. But some days I'll try and get that up around the five or six thousand. Um, after that, a bit of head freeze kind of sets in. But I can do a bit in the morning and then go back to it in the evening. I try and mix it up and do a bit of, I do some marketing every day. I'll set up a campaign, um, an AMS campaign. Uh, well, I'll set up, you know, 10 for, or 12 for the number of books that I have um, every day. Um, do you tend to do, do you get up early in the morning and write or do you? Um, no, I, I get everybody out to school um, and then I'm kind of okay. incognito then for the rest of the day till they come home, frequently still in my pyjamas when okay. I come home. <laughs> and when do you do the marketing? <laughs> uh, in between times when my head is fried from writing, you want to have a I go break. and do the yeah. marketing and then when the head is fried from marketing, I go back to writing. It's a, yeah. it's a kind of, they're, they're two very different, it's very left brain, right brain actually, mm. so it's quite refreshing. Yeah. You know, because it doesn't require any creativity really to, to set up campaigns and to, to monitor. And like I spend a lot of time answering emails. I try and answer, there was another piece of advice I got from Mark early on. I try and answer everybody who emails me. I don't always succeed. I get a lot of email. Um, but I try in as much as I can to respond to people when they contact me. I think it's, and I have a very loyal base. Um, I have a, a, you know, a healthy list. Okay, um, well, we'll talk about audience uh, in uh, a yeah. moment. So in, uh, sticking on process, um, you're, you said earlier that you, you pants, I think is the expression. I yeah. hate that expression, but um, uh, I think it's Karen Slaughter said to us, it sounds like a porn film, pants or... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. Um, but basically you don't plot very much. You write and see where it goes. Absolutely. I have no idea where it's going to go. And... This might sound a little bit flaky, but I, I believe that um, all the story, you know, they say that every story that's ever been told is in the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. So all the stories exist already. And some people are just chosen to be the storytellers and we're fortunate that we are. So um, it's just a case of letting it happen, for me anyway. I sometimes will, you know, stay up writing until maybe two or three or four o'clock in the morning. And then I'll get into bed freezing to my husband and go, you're not going to believe what's after happening to him. <laughs> so you're as surprised as anybody else. I'm as stunned as anybody yeah. else, yeah. Um, yeah. And things go in ways that I never really anticipated, um, which is good and bad. It's good in the sense that you have to just trust the process, you know, because sometimes I think, what if I, what if I don't have any more stories? What, what if I have nothing more to say? Uh, well, I, find is, that, I find that fascinating because it's different from what I'm doing now, which is really in, in the plotting phase again. <laughs> but you're, you can follow a character and you can see how they react to a situation. But every now and again, you've got to do something to them, right? There's got to be a car crash or there's got to be something yeah. that happens. So you must, when do you decide, when you're pantsing, to use that expression, when do you decide, I'm going to shake things up? Someone's going to get killed now or... It just... It, it's, <laughs> 
I was like, Madam Zara. It just comes to me. Uh, yeah, I'll be typing away. I type fast. And next thing I'll go, oh, he's going to die now. Right. And sure enough, <laughs> he'll die. Writers are all murderers, aren't they? Obviously, yeah, they're all murderers. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. They're all murderers. Yeah. Okay, all right. That's, uh, and then, then you get to the end of the book. And how different is the published draft to your first draft? Oh, wildly different. Wildly different. And the, the next thing that has to happen in my books is they have to get sent to Helen in Helen Falconer in County Mayo. And she reads them. And then I drive all the way to the other end of the country because it has to be a kind of a physical thing we do. So we sit down for about five hours and she says, I have no idea what you're doing with that. He should be dead. He should have told her that. I don't know why they exist. You know, move her forward, take him back. Um, and then I come home and bash it into shape. Right. Sounds um, like she's worth her weight in gold, this She editor. 100% is, yes. She 100% is. She's amazing. We need to get Helen Falconer on the you podcast do. at some point, talk you about do. stories. She's it sounds a, amazing. She's a structural editor and she can just... She can just see, you know, she can see things clearly. It's, it's any, any writer, you know, you're up too close to the work. You can't see. You know, it's like asking your, your own kids good looking. Yeah. Everybody thinks their kids are good looking, you know, but they can't all be. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you're up too close to the work. So um, you need somebody who's got that precision and Helen definitely has it. And she does it with hilarity. I and mean, we were frequently in just hysterics at the things I write she's like ah seriously I mean no come on like how could that happen and I'm like I don't so it was three o'clock in the morning I was yeah uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly we were talking about Helen and um and the hilarity that ensues when you read back what you've written <laughs> yeah. at various points. but clearly there's an engaging story there and you are an engaging storyteller that must be said well I hope so <laughs> <laughs> well clearly you I are so. which brings me on to your audience um and this is an area that I think that probably the most varied area when we talk to authors is how they re- interact with their audience. And, and we've had authors on, very prolific, very best-selling authors, who hold parties for their readers, you know, have a very active engagement with their readers, and others who, who are more in the traditional role, like Stephen yeah. King barely meets his readers yeah. in the way that we do. Um, probably it's a bad example, but something, you know. Yeah, yeah. Traditional publishers. You have a, a bit of an active community of your readers, I and a, I think you enjoy it. I have it. a great community. I have two communities, really. I have my, my, my advanced reader team, who are 250 people, okay. um, who have all volunteered to pre-read my books, and they are wonderful. I, I dedicated my last book to them because they're just incredible. They find every single typo. Even after a proofread, you'll still have one or two, or 12 in my case. Um, so they find all of that. Um, I've just sent them a book where um, there's quite a bit of French in it because it's set during the, it's set around the French resistance. And they're going, there's an E in that and that accent has gone the wrong way. And you know, it, I have people who send me emails saying, you know that plant that you said, actually, when you put an E on that, that makes it a poisonous, a totally different poisonous plant. Not, you know what I mean? Just fabulous. Uh, one of my advanced readers, um, is part of uh, the Ottawa Storytellers and um, he, Bob Woods, and Bob contacted me a couple of years ago and said they'd love to turn the book into one of the books into a stage show and would I mind? I was like, would I mind? I'd love it. It would be amazing. So my family and I have just come back from Canada uh, where we saw that performed in the National Arts Centre in Ottawa. looking at Justin Trudeau's office and it was just wow. an amazing experience to see my, my book turn into a How weird. A I mean, show. very few people, lots of authors say it's in, you know, there's an idea, Hollywood's got an idea, an option, so, but few get to sit down and watch oh, it being realised by somebody I else. Can't and was, was it describe was it. Was it close to the way that you imagined the characters would be? Yes. Yes, it was like it was like an hour and a half of deja vu, wow. <laughs> knowing what they're going to say next. But they did a, such a spectacularly good job that actually the way they interpreted the characters, they interpreted them better than I had originally written them. You know, um, and it was just an amazing experience. And uh, I wrote my husband into the book uh, in my first book. He's a he's a, an Illin piper, so he's a plays the Irish like what? Irish bagpipes. Oh, okay. Um, but you sit down to play them, and they're they're okay. nationally protected and all that. Illand piper. Illand. It's Ill- the Irish. Illand is okay. the Irish word for elbow. Okay. Um, and it, so he's he's in the book, 
And in the course of a conversation with Bob in Canada, I said something about Dermot and he said, oh, that's the name of the guy in the book who plays the pipes. And I said, yeah, that is, that is him. My husband is a piper. So they had organized an Ellen Piper to play in the show, uh, who tragically got the boot, I'm sorry. And he was like, oh my God, could we have the actual Piper play? So my husband was in the part of the wow. stage show, which was lovely as well. And my children came and my parents and um, oh, it was amazing. And did that, that contact come from readers yeah, initially? Yeah, yeah, he's one of my so, advanced so that, readers, yeah. There you go, there's the benefit of, oh, of, of cultivating that audience. But, like I will often get a phone call or an email to say we're coming on our holidays to Ireland we're going to be in Killarney I'm like oh swing by have a cup of tea you know Mm -hmm. so people call to my house I go out to meet them I met a lady and her daughter just a couple of weeks ago for drinking Killarney Um, I love it you know why wouldn't you what's not to love about somebody who's read your books and wants to meet you, you know? uh, and I do think that's a very good audience the Irish American audience because oh, yeah. you know, we we go to I've just got back from the States and the States quite often and uh, people will very often tell you I'm Irish mm. they'll say I mean I'm yeah. actually quite Irish because my grandparents my maternal grandparents were Irish and I'm very often more Irish than the American who says to me I'm Irish oh, yeah 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 there's there's a six generations ago, but yeah. it, it just means a lot to them and it's it also a, huge it's a, a nice part of their life they for them yeah. despite the troubled history that there yeah. has been over the years. For them, it's a romantic Absolutely. connection with a beautiful green island. Absolutely. So you've got people in the right frame of mind on, the, on a romantic part of what they want to think about and yes. you're selling into them. So that's quite clever. Yes. Uh, yeah, I didn't do it on purpose, but it's how it's turned out. I suppose because I, I worked with people like that for so long, um, there's a danger in any culture to patronise the expats or those mm-hmm. descendants you know um, and be I, I've always maintained that Irish American culture is a culture in its own right it's born out of Ireland it doesn't necessarily have a whole pile to do with an Ireland of today um, so I I think I, I'm probably good at that if I was to say I'm good at anything I'm, I'm probably good at uh, knowing what people in who enjoy that culture and who are part of that culture they don't enjoy being patronized they don't enjoy what i call paddy wackery nonsense about shamrocks and leprechauns and all that don't do any of that that's rubbish um but we have a a really interesting history and culture and a huge connection to the united states huge you know um and i i I write about that so a lot of my characters have either dual citizenship or they're americans in ireland or irish people in america um, and is that across all the books, all the no, different series? No, just the, one? the series, the trilogy isn't. Everything else is, yeah. Okay. Everything else is. Okay. There's a, there's a, there's an American element, I suppose, to well, to most of my books. I won't say all of them, but to most of my books, there's an Irish. So, how big's your mailing list? My list is about six thousand. It was at one point about twelve thousand, and I've cut that down because I don't see the point of paying for people who are only wasting my time. Uh, so when people unsubscribe, I don't get upset about that. I'm like, see, so, yeah, I couldn't be bothered paying for you if you're not going to, sure. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't bother me at all. In fact, I'm quite relieved when people unsubscribe. Uh, they don't in any great numbers, to be fair. Um, and then I have, so yeah, they're very active. Um, I have a, about a thousand people on my Facebook page that, you know, are active as well. Um, but I engage a lot with them. You know what I mean? And when people comment, I respond or I, I like what they say or I, you know, there's a lot of work in that. But it definitely pays off. And, and even saying that sounds bad because that sounds like that's why I'm doing it, which it actually isn't. I love the idea that I'm connected, you know, and that people feel like they know me. And, you know, I'll send them out an email with a picture of the dog and tell them about where I was at the weekend. And they'll email me back and tell me about their children and their families. and. You know, it's it's really fabulous. And it's been so, you know, I'm writing a book at the moment about a, a, a black soldier in, in uh, here during the Second World War. And I had a lot of questions about that, about how things worked mechanically when they went back. And I have such a vast audience of people who have such huge knowledge, you know, that I just put out a question and by in an hour, I have responses going, well, my grandfather was in the, you know, the Tuskegee Airmen or my grandmother was this or whatever. And 
you can you couldn't buy that. No. You just couldn't buy it. No, it's amazing, isn't it? Well, yeah. Mark gets emails from people saying the Glock 9mm didn't have a safety catch. Didn't you know that? <laughs> so oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I get a lot of that. You get quite a scarier, yeah. scarier yeah. amount of knowledge out, out Yeah, there, I do so. get it. I get yeah, a bit of that, that as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, but that's fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jean, it's been brilliant talking to you. I said right at the beginning, I think you had a really healthy attitude. And the fact that we you've flown on this budget airline and you were saying everyone has a go at Ryanair, but it's well run and it gets you from one place to another yeah. and it's a good sign. I think there's been probably a little switch from your public service life to being an entrepreneur. You're maybe not even aware of. You're starting to work out how things work and you're good at yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. Like, I think the whole business with Amazon... Yeah, Amazon is amazing. Yeah. Amazon is amazing. Let's stop for a second. Where would any of us be without them? You know, I'd be still a teacher. Everybody would be still doing whatever they were doing before with no possibility really of this ever turning into anything. And that is even if you do get a deal. I mean, I have a lot of traditionally published friends who are frankly skint, mm. you know. Um, it's hard to make money. Even if you have a penguin deal or a hachette deal or whatever, it's hard to make money. This is amazing, you know, and we could do it with such ease. And yes, they're a gigantic company. And yes, people will tell you, oh, they're awful to work for. And people don't get to go to the toilet if they work for Amazon or whatever. Look, that's not really, I don't work for Amazon, you know you know it's awful if that's when true everyone, or whatever but like when everyone ever gets big people yeah, will start, start to have a go but it's them. been a transformative company isn't it in, absolutely for and lives. i think it's a very bad mindset for you as a writer if you're going to decide that they're the enemy yeah you know you're on a trajectory there that you don't want to be on yeah you know so there's loads of help if amazon are you know doing something that is causing you some problems you know, if you do the course, there will be tons of people who can give you a workaround. There's always a way around it. There's always a way around I it. I love the fact you brought it back to the course. So, so to finish it. So, <laughs> See those sales yeah. there. <laughs> you did a great job, Jim. Look, thank you so much indeed. It was my uh, pleasure. For I really to enjoyed podcast it. podcast and chatting to us to, today. It's been brilliant. And really, uh, I wish you success. What's, thank my, you very much. I should ask you, final, what's next? Is there a new new genre somewhere? Um, yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, okay. I'm thinking of doing some traveling with my family, okay. um, which I think will inspire some new direction, okay. a bit of new direction. Well, we look forward to hearing um, about that. Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, all, it's all looking bright at the moment anyway. Jean, a uh, great person, really fun uh, to chat with her. And um, yeah, so that's, uh, I mean, her books, I don't, I'm struggling a little bit to describe the genre, but you know the type of Book, I mean, it's a sort of family saga, saga, dynasty, that type of thing. Sagas, oh, that's ex- exactly the, the right word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and she's somebody who uh, has just gone from this position of it not being a living for her to it being a very good living for her, uh, which has been absolutely fantastic. And she was very obviously grateful to you, Mark, for showing her the ways and hows of uh, how to find your readers. Something you're quite good at. Apparently so. Who would have guessed that? But um, yes, no, it's lovely to hear that, she, that she's doing so well. So yeah, fantastic. Now we should say, um, without plugging ourselves too much, the course to which Jean attributes so much of her uh, financial success is opening again next week. So that's November the 7th, going to be open for a couple of weeks. That's uh, Mark Dawson's Ads for Authors. Mark Dawson's Ad for Authors. You get top billing uh, there. And um uh, if, right. you, if you want to go onto the wait list, if you're not on it already, uh, or you want to go and visit the course uh, page to read more about it, you can go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash ads for authors, all spelt out using English ads for authors, F-O-R in the middle, not the number four. Spelt. That's the one I always get confused about. Spelt is like a seed or something. It's a bit of wheat and spelled, I think is correct, isn't it? Or can you use both? Oh my goodness! This is on a podcast about writing. Well, you're yeah. You should. Do, do you not know? Spelled. Spelled. Of I know. Spelled. If you spelled, spelled something in the past, it's spelled with an ed. You can't have spelt something. So if I say it's spelled adds four authors f o r, that's correct because I'm saying it has been spelled like that in the past. Correct. Yes. So yeah, when's when the self publishing formula is brought to you by Grammarly? Um, when's it okay to say spelt? <laughs> When you're talking about the thing that you can um, make bread with. 
that would be okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, people do say spelt though, don't they? And I, I have a feeling it's one of those things that um, Dictionary Corner on Countdown, a UK show about words, is going to say it's okay to say spelt because that's what people say because language develops. Right. Okay. I, I always work on what the Queen would say. I don't know the, the, queen. the queen. The Queen wouldn't say wouldn't say spelt. No, she, she wouldn't say spelt. Philip. God bless her. <laughs> yes, Philip, get out of here. Your vulgar language. Good. Have you got anything else to say? Any other tips for me? No, I just basically, you know, pull your finger out and, um, you know, let's get this novel finished. You've got till the end of the month. Oh my goodness, it's not going to be the end of the month, I'll tell you that now. Good, okay, it's been uh, it's been fun, NaNoWriMo, keep going, get that word count, just write the words, that's what NaNoWriMo is all about. First draft, don't worry about uh, the order structure or anything else, get the words done every day, and at the end of it you'll be, uh, you'll have something to work on. Good, and you, and you finish your police procedure, so you'll start something else during NaNoWriMo. Probably, yeah, no, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next, I've got a couple of ideas, but yeah, I've got to get this done first. He's a machine. Good. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time. We'll see you next time.